Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, this is lecture 27 of basic calculus 1. Uh, in the last two lectures, we had introduced the notion of definite integral. Remember, our quest was there to find a function whose derivative will be the given function. And we came to introduce the notion of area. That area has been defined as the that particular area below this uh, curve and uh, uh, bounded by that curve and x axis and two lines x equal to a and x equal to b. So, that we thought that it was differentiation, differentiation of the area would give us the function. This is what we thought that is why we introduced this way. Now, time has come to show that it is really working that way, right. So, that means, we need to prove some result like this. If f of x is a continuous function on the closed interval a to b, then you write f of x that is capital F equal to integral a to x f of t dt for any x inside this interval a to b. Then f, f of x, this is capital F of x is differentiable on closed interval a b and capital F prime will be equal to small f. That is what required here, right. That is which means that the integrals, differentiation of the integral will be the curve, will be the function given. That is what we wanted when you say that it is the reverse process of integration. Not only that, we really need two. One is if you take the integral like this f of x equal to integral a to x f of t dt then its derivative should be equal to small f and then another will be integral of the derivative should be equal to that function. So, that will come as fundamental theorem of calculus 2. This is really fundamental theorem of calculus 1. So, now the conditions are f of x is continuous on a b and then we know integral a to x f t d t exists. So, call that as the function f of x. Now, all that we have to do is show that this capital F which is a to x f t d t is differentiable and its derivative is equal to f of x at any point x inside this closed interval f. Okay. So, to show this let us start with some point c inside the open interval f. We will come to the end points later. Suppose c is a point inside a b and let us take any h which is not equal to 0 such that c plus h belongs to a p. So, now we are having a point c and then we are choosing some h. So, that say it is a to b some c you have chosen. Then you choose h in such a way that c plus h should belong to this interval. So, that means h cannot go beyond this c minus a or c minus b modulus. It cannot be larger than that. So, such an h can be chosen. Now, let us take some h like this which is c plus h belongs to a b that is given. Then we formulate this we want to show that capital F prime at c. So, that will be by definition limit of h goes to 0 f of c plus h minus f c divided by h. So, we try to compute this what this exactly means in terms of the integral. Now, f of c plus h equal to integral a to c plus h f of t d t and f of c capital F of c is integral a to c f of t dt. So, we subtract then and divide by h. Now, due to the property of the integral it is a to c plus h it is a to c. So, if you subtract you get c to c plus h. 
So, that is what we write 1 by h integral c to c plus h f of t dt. So, this is just the ratio and we are interested in finding out what is the value of this expression 1 by h integral c to c plus h when h approaches 0. Now, let us look at this integral. Now, we can apply mean value theorem for integrals over this. So, 1 by h, h is the in interval length that is c plus h minus c. So, we can apply mean value theorem for integrals that gives c to c plus h f t dt equal to it is achieved at some point. So, it is not this it is 1 by h 1 by h times c to c plus h f t dt equal to f of alpha for some alpha in c to c plus h. Okay, now, if h goes to 0, then where do alpha goes? Alpha is in between c to c plus h. So, alpha will go to c. right? So, now, we are interested in finding the limit of this expression. Okay? So, that limit will be called limit h goes to 0 a plus c plus h minus f c by h, which is limit of this as h goes to 0, which is same thing as limit of f alpha as h goes to 0, but as h goes to 0 alpha also goes to c. So, we can write this is equal to limit alpha goes to c f of alpha. Now, that f is continuous. So, limit alpha goes to c f of alpha is equal to f of c. So, you wanted really this much that because the left side is derivative at c. So, capital F prime at c is equal to f of c that is what we have obtained. Moreover, at x equal to c, f x is also differentiable. So, this means at every point interior point of the interval a to b, we see that f prime c equal to f of c. It remains to decide about the end points a and b. So, at a, it will be limit h goes to from the posit positive side it is coming. So, let a x goes to or h goes to 0 plus f of c plus h minus f c by h, h goes to 0 plus and c is a now. So, this similar process will continue and we will find that that is equal to f prime at a equal to f of a, a prime a is the one sided derivative here. Similarly, at b it will be h goes to 0 minus and you would get c c plus h. Okay. So, then you have at the end points also a similar thing is happening. That is why we say that f prime x equal to f of x for every x inside the closed interval a b and that gives the proof of the uh, result. So, this is only one side of the inverse process ad, as we have thought. Okay? That is if you have f of t as a continuous function, this particular f you would define then its derivative will be equal to f of x. So, derivative of the integral equal to the function that is what basically it says. Okay. Let us see the other process that integral of the derivative should be equal to that function also. So, let us formulate first it says let g x be a continuously differentiable function on f. So, you want the derivative of g to be continuous so that integration will exist. It can exist in some un, under some less restrictions, but we are happy with continuity itself. So, then what does it say? The result says that integral a to b g prime x dx equal to g b minus g a. So, that means if you take any point c instead of b, it would give you g of c minus g of a. So, you would get integral of the derivative equal to that function with minus g of a there. So, we will see how it is resolved. So, now let us have a proof of this. Now, assumption is that g prime x is continuous on f. So, since it is continuous, it is integrable. So, it makes sense to write a to b g prime x dx. Now, you want to evaluate this and see that it is equal to g at b minus g at a. But what is this integral? By definition, we have to take a partition, form the Riemann sum, take the limit as norm of the partition goes to 0. So, let us start with a partition, say p is a partition of the closed interval a to b and then consider the function g x on the sub intervals. We have to take the sub intervals. Now, let us say uh, 
you consider g x its restriction g is defined on minus uh, sorry x i minus 1 to x i to r then it is continuous on this closed interval of course, it is differentiable because that is assumed then by mean value theorem for the derivatives there exists a point c i inside this such that g of x i minus g of x i minus 1 equal to g prime at c i into x i minus x i minus 1. If you remember we have used this trick in solving one or two problems uh, where forming the integral of 0 to 1 cosine x and so on. Okay, we are using the using really this idea in the proof of this to solve that problem. Now, we have come back to the original proof. So, here we use just mean value theorem to find a point c i such that g prime c i equal to g of x i minus g of x i minus 1 divided by x i minus x i minus 1. Okay. Then since these c i's are fixed inside the sub intervals, we choose our choice set as the set of all these points c i. So, once we choose the Riemann sum S G P C will be equal to G prime C, this is really G prime not G. So, S of G prime P C equal to summation G prime of C i x i minus x i minus 1. But due to our mean value theorem, this summand is equal to G of x i minus G of x i minus 1. Now, this is a telescopic sum. sum. So, you have uh, at i equal to 1 will stay here and the end one g of x n will stay. So, g of x n is g b and g of x 1 is g a. So, you get g b minus g a. Then when you take the limit as norm p goes to 0, since it is a number, it is a constant, the limit also should be equal to g b minus g a and that is the proof. So, the proof ends here that integral a to b g prime x dx equal to g b minus g a. So, let us see on the total what we have done. So, the conclusions of the theorems tell that the first theorem says derivative of integral a to x f t dt equal to f x. And the second one, now instead of b, we take the closed interval a to x, there only we are thinking of this f prime. So, integral a to x f prime t dt equal to f x minus f a, which we also write this way, it helps in computing the integral. So, we write f x minus f a as f of t with limits as x, top limit x, bottom limit a. So, this is another notation for writing f x minus f a. These two things we have got from the two fundamental theorem. So, now you can see together they imply that integration is really the inverse process of differentiation. Okay. You would get integral of the derivative is f x up to a constant and derivative of the integral a to x is equal to f of x. Okay, so, this constant we cannot avoid because we know if derivatives of two functions are same, then those two functions can be uh, can be uh, can differ by some constant. So, here because we take the integral a to x, we have that constant as f of a. Okay. So, the remark we are just giving a remark that the only assumption we use is continuity. So, continue in the first one we have continuity of f, in the second one we have continuity of f prime, right. So, that is how we get these results. Now, for the definite integral a to b f t dt, what is that? That is really we have started from the definition which is the signed area bounded by the curve y equal to f of x or y equal to f of t and the lines x equal to a and x equal to b and the x axis. So, it is something like this y equal to f of x, you have x equal to a, x equal to b, this is the x axis. So, this is the area which is our integral, integral a to b f of t dt. So, with that only we started and obtained these two results. So, second theorem again implies that if f x is continuous, then the differential equation y prime equal to f x with given y a has a solution. What does that mean? So, if you start with y prime equal to f x, f of x, you want to find one function y such that its derivative will be f of x, right. So, f of x is here, its derivative should be f of x. So, the function should be the integral, right. 
So, once the integral is there, you would come back to f x minus f a, where this f of a is given, right? Given y of a. So, f of a is given, therefore, you can always solve this differential equation to get at least one solution. We will see how it is applied later. Okay. So, we will introduce something new here because always we have this f x minus f a, this a is there. So, this does not say that uh, you have integral of 2 x is equal to x square. We know that if you differentiate x square, you get 2 x. If it is reverse process, you should get integral 2 x dx equal to x square, right. But we know that it can differ by a constant. So, it should be something like this. This is what we want to formalize now. We will say that a function f of x capital F of x that satisfies f prime x equal to small f of x that f of x is called an antiderivative of f of x. So, that means you differentiate that you get this function. So, in a way it is antiderivative of f of x. So, the first theorem shows that antiderivative of a continuous function f x can be given by f of x equal to integral a to x f of t dt, right? Because once you differentiate this, you would get back f of x. So, capital f of x is a an antiderivative of this. So, this says f prime x equal to g prime x implies g x equal to f x plus c. So, in general, the antiderivative can be written or should be written this way because two functions having the same derivative might differ by a constant. So, if you take another function g, that g will be equal to this antiderivative f of x plus c, which means integral a to x f of t dt plus c for some constant c. We do not know which constant. So, these things in general we will be writing or giving another symbol for it. When a to x f t dt plus c, we will write as the integral without any limits f of x dx, will, which will read as indefinite integral of the function f of x. So, that means this indefinite integral, integral f of x dx is equal to integral a to x f t dt plus c for some a, right? Because f is defined on that a. So, first endpoint we are taking. In fact, you can take any other endpoint also. So, that the constant will be coming, right? Plus some constant, that constants will accommodate that a itself. But in general, we will be talking that indefinite integral is this, where we do not write a to b or a to x. Fine. So, what do we see is that integral f of x, this is indefinite integral, is a definite integral a to x, x should be same a to x f of t dt plus c for some constant c. When you take a particular value of c, we would get back an, an antiderivative. So, all the antiderivatives are given by this where c varies over all real numbers, right. These are all the antiderivatives possible. Okay. So, now if you look at the fundamental theorems, we can write them in terms of the antiderivatives. If you write f of x equal to this indefinite integral f of x dx, then it is when it is taking the limits the definite integral, we turn to the definite integral a to b, then that will be equal to capital F b minus capital of capital F of a, right. This is clear. Something like suppose you have x square plus c that is your antiderivative of integral of 2 x. Then you take f of b minus f of a that will give b square plus c minus a square plus c that will be b square minus a square. You see that c is gone. That should be equal to f of b minus f of a which should have been our this indefinite integral is x square. So, x square evaluated at b and a and then subtracted. So, we say if f of x is the indefinite integral then a to b the definite integral f x dx equal to capital F b minus capital F of a. And also we have seen the second uh, fundamental theorem that says the indefinite integral of f prime equal to f x plus c, where small f x and capital F prime x are this way related. In fact, we have done for the definite integral a to x equal to f of x minus f of a and the c accommodates that f of a it can be any arbitrary constant. So, these are the mainly two results which the fundamental theorems tell us. 
okay if f of x is the indefinite integral then that when evaluated a to b the definite integral a to b equal to capital f b minus capital f of a and indefinite integral of f prime x dx equal to f x plus c. So, after this we will not always read indefinite integral we just say integral f prime x dx and for the definite integral we will say integral from a to b f of x dx that way we will be reading it. So, if you give that example we have already seen how the example works that is how integral a to b 2 x dx we will be writing as any indefinite integral which is x square plus c and evaluated at a and b that gives c really gets cancelled. So, you get same thing as x square evaluated at a and b that gives b square minus a square. So, this will really help us in evaluating some integrals if you know if you have something some results about the derivatives. Here you see if you know that the derivative of f is f prime you know how to connect them say it is tan x it will be second square x. So, you can say integral of second square x dx equal to tan x plus c that is the way we will be using the derivatives to come back to integrals. So, these fundamental theorems will help us in finding out the definite and indefinite integrals provided we have the knowledge of the derivatives of some elementary functions. So, how the derivatives and the integrals are related that we know. If we go back to our earlier repertory that such function has such derivative that we can now rewrite in terms of the indefinite integral. 